Hi, this is Philip Pador, founder of NCLEX RN 45 Day Challenge. In this video, I'm going to be talking about congestive heart failure. Heart failure is used to describe a point at which the heart can supply enough blood to meet the body's demands. And this can happen in two ways. Either the heart's ventricles can pump hard enough during systole and is called systolic heart failure or not enough blood fills into the ventricles during diastole, called diastolic heart failure. In both cases, blood backs up into the lungs, causing suggestions or fluids buildup, which is why it's also often called as congestive heart failure, or just a CHF. Congestive heart failure affects millions of people around the world. And since it means that the body's needs aren't being met, it can ultimately lead to death. Part of the reasons why so many people are affected by heart failure is that there are a wide variety of heart diseases, like ischemia and valvular disease that can impair the heart's ability to pump out blood. And over time can ultimately cause the heart to fail. First off is systolic heart failure. It's kind of a mathematical way to think about this one. Is that the heart to squeeze out a certain volume of blood each minute, called cardiac output, which can be rephrased as the heart rate, or the number of beats in a minute multiplied by the stroke volume, the volume of the blood squeezed out with each heartbeat. The heart rate is pretty intuitive, but the stroke volume is a little tricky. For example, an adult heart might beat 70 times per minute, and the left ventricle might squeeze out 70 milliliters per beat. So 70 times 70 equals cardiac output of 4,900 millimeters per minute, which is almost 5 liters per minute. So notice that not all the blood was pumped out, right? And the stroke volume is just the fraction of the total volume. The total volume might be closer to 110 millimeters in 70 millimeters is the fraction that got ejected with each beat. The other 40 millimeters kind of lingers in the left ventricles in the next beat, right? In this example, the ejection fraction would be 70 millimeters divided by 110 millimeters or about 64%. Normal ejection fraction is around 50 to 70 percent. Between 40 to 50 percent would be considered borderline, and anything about 40 percent or less indicates systolic, systolic heart failure because the heart's only squeezing out a little bit of blood each beat. So, in our example, if the total volume of, of the left ventricle was 110 millimeters but only 44 millimeters was pumped out with each beat, then you have 44 millimeters divided by 110 millimeters, which is 40, 40%. And we would say that the person is, is in systolic heart failure. Now, in addition to systolic heart failure, you also got diastolic heart failure, which is where the heart squeezing hard enough but not filling quite enough. In this case, again, the stroke volume is low, but the, but the ejection fraction is normal. How is that? Well, it's not filling enough, so there's a low total volume. Say about 69 millimeters, well, even though both are low. 44 millimeters divided by 69 millimeters is still 64%. In this situation, the failures are caused by abnormal filling of the ventricles so that the chambers doesn't get fully loaded or stretch out in the first place. Another term for this is having a reduced preload, which is the volume of blood that's in the ventricle right before the ventricle muscles contracts. Important relationships between systolic and diastolic functions is the frank starling mechanism, which basically shows that the loading up the ventricle with blood during diastole and stretching out the cardiac muscles make it contract with the more forest which increases stroke volume during systole. This is a kind of like how stretching out a rubber band makes snap even harder. 
except that the cardiac muscles is actively contracting, where is the rubber band is passively going back to its relaxed state. All right, so heart failure can affect the right ventricle or the left ventricle or both ventricles. So someone might have right-sided heart failure, left-sided heart failure, or both, which is called biventricular heart failure, each of which can have systolic or diastolic heart failure. Having said that if less blood exits either ventricle, it will affect the other since they work in series. So these terms really refer to the primary problem affecting the heart. Basically, which one is first? Usually, left-sided heart failure is caused by systolic or pumping dysfunctions. And this is typically due to some kind of damage to the myocardium or the heart muscles, which means it can't contract as forcefully and pump blood efficiently. Ischemic heart disease caused by coronary artery atherosclerosis or plaque buildup is the common cause in the case less blood and oxygen gets through the coronary artery. Sometimes the coronary is blocked completely and that a person has a heart attack. They might be left with the scar tissues that doesn't contract at all, which again means that the heart can contract is forcefully. Long-standing hypertension is another common cause of heart failure. This is because as arterial pressure increases in a systemic circulation, it gets harder for the left ventricle to pump blood out into the hypertensive circulation. It gets harder for the left ventricle to pump blood out into that hypertensive systemic circulation. To compensate, the left ventricle actually bulks up and its muscles hypertrophied or grow so that the ventricle contract with more force. The increase in muscle mass also means that there's a greater demand for oxygen. And to make things even worse, the coronaries get squeezed down by the extra muscles so that even less blood delivered to that tissue. More demand and reduced supply means that some of the ventricular muscles starts to have a weaker contraction, leading to systolic failure. Another potential cause will be dilated cardiomyopathy. With the heart chambers dilates or grows in size in an attempt to fill the ventricles with larger and larger volumes of blood or preload, stretch out the muscle walls and increases contraction strength. View the Frank Starling mechanism. Even though this can actually work for a little while, over time the muscle walls get thinner and weaker, eventually leading the muscles that are so thinned out that causes systolic life, left-sided heart failure. Ultimately, the ventricular wall seemed to be the right size relative to the size of the chamber in order for the heart to work effectively. Any major deviations from that can lead to heart failure. All right, even though systolic failure is most common in left-sided heart failure, diastolic heart failure or feeling dysfunctions can also happen. In hypertension, remember how the left ventricle hypertrophy one, that hypertrophy is concentric, which means that the, the new sarcomeres are generated in parallel with the existing ones. This means that as the heart muscle walls enlarges, it crowds into the ventricular chamber space, resulting in less room for bluff, meaning that in addition to contributing to the systolic dysfunction, hypertension also can cause diastolic heart failure. Concentric hypertrophy leading to a diastolic heart failure can also be caused by aortic stenosis, which is a narrowing of the aortic valve opening, as well as by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, an abnormal ventricular wall thickening often from a genetic cause. Restrictive cardiomyopathy aren't yet another cause. In this case, the heart muscles get the stiffer and less compliant ultimately causing fluid retention which fills the heart a bit more during diastole and increases preload, which increases construction strength again by the Frank Starling mechanism. Unfortunately, just like the other strategies, in the long term retaining fluid so that 
more fluid remains in the blood vessels, typically leads to a large portion of it leaking into the tissues and can, con and can contribute to the fluid building up in the lungs and other parts of the body, which can worsen the symptoms of the heart failure. So a major clinical signs of the heart not being able to pump blood forward to the body is the blood starts of backup into the lungs. A backup of blood in the pulmonary veins in capillary beds can increase the pressure in the pulmonary artery. It can also result in the fluid moving from the blood vessels to the interstitial space causing pulmonary edema or congestion. In the alveoli, in the lungs, all this extra fluid makes oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange a lot harder. Since a wider layer of fluid takes more time for oxygen and carbon dioxide to diffuse through. And therefore, patients have dyspnea or troubled breathing, as well as orthopnea, which is a difficulty breathing when lying down flat. Since it allows venous blood to more easily flow back from the legs and the gut, to the heart and eventually into the pulmonary circulation. These extra fluids in the lungs causes crackles and rails to be heard on auscultations while the patient's breathing. If enough fluid filled some of these capillaries in the lungs, they can actually rupture leaking blood into the alveoli. Alveolar macrophages then eat up these red blood cells which causes them to take on his brownish color from iron buildup. And then they called the macrophages, also known as the heart failure cells. For left-sided heart failure, certain medications can be prescribed to help improve blood flow, like ACE inhibitors, which help dilate blood vessels, as well as diuretics, help reduce the overall fluid buildup in the body which helps prevent the hypertensions from worsening the heart failure. Now let's switch gears and think about right-sided heart failure, which is actually often caused by left-sided heart failure. Okay, remember, okay, remember how blood buildup increases the pressure in the pulmonary artery? Well, this increased pulmonary blood pressure makes it harder for the right side to pump blood into. In this case, the heart failure will be biventricular, since both ventricles are affected. Someone could also have isolated the right-sided heart failure though. An example of this would be a left to the right cardiac shunt. In these cases, there might be a cardiac shunt, like an atrioseptal defect or a ventricular septal defect that allows blood to flow from the higher pressure left side to the lower pressure right side, which increases fluid volume on the right side and can eventually lead to concentric hypertrophy of the right ventricle, making it more prone to ischemia, which is a systolic dysfunction, and have a smaller volume and become less compliant, which is a diastolic function. Another potential cause of isolated right-sided failure is a chronic lung disease. Lung disease often make it hard to exchange oxygen right. Well, in response to low oxygen levels or hypoxia, the pulmonary arterial constrict which rises the pulmonary blood pressure. Lung disease often make it hard to exchange oxygen right. The pulmonary arterial constrict which rises the pulmonary blood pressure. This just like before, it makes it harder for the right side of the heart to pump against and can lead to right-sided hypertrophy and heart failure. When chronic lung disease leads to the right side of hypertrophy and failure, as known as core pulmonale, with the left-sided failure blood is backed up into the lungs. With the right-sided heart failure, bloods get backed up to the body, and so the patient has congestion in the veins of the systemic heart circulation. One common manifestation of this is jugular venous distension. For the jugular vein that brings blood back to the heart, takes on more blood and becomes enlarged to extend in the neck. Also in the body when blood backs up to the liver and the spleen. Fluid can move to the interstitial spaces within those organs and they can become enlarged, called hepatosplenomegaly, which could be painful. And it delivers congested 
for long periods of time. Patients can eventually develop cirrhosis and liver failure, which would be called cardiac cirrhosis. Assess interstitial fluid near the surface of the liver and spleen. Access interstitial fluid near the surface of the liver and the spleen could also move right out into the peritoneal space as well. And since that cavity can take a lot of fluid before there's any increase in pressure. A lot of fluid can build up in the peritoneal space which is called ascites. Finally, food that backs up into the interstitial space of the soft tissue of the legs causes pitting edema. With the issue was visible swollen and when you apply pressure to it, it leaves a pit and takes a while to come back to its original place. This is generally affects the legs in the most people because gravity generally causes the majority of the fluid to pull in the dependent parts of the body, which is the legs when you're standing in the sacrum and essentially the lower back when you're lying down. The right-sided heart failure will be treated similarly to the left-sided heart failure, especially because it's often a result of a life of a left-sided heart failure. Therefore, medications like ACE inhibitors and diuretics might be prescribed. With heart failure, we saw that sometimes the muscle wall stretching thin out or sometimes it can thicken and become ischemic. In either case, those heart cells get irritated and these can lead to heart arrhythmias. With arrhythmia, the ventricles don't contract and sink anymore, making them less able to pump blood out. And worsening this whole situation, in some cases, patients might be prescribed with cardiac resynchronization therapy pacemakers, which can stimulate the ventricles to contract in the same time and potentially improve the blood to pump out. Alternatively, for the heart failure in general, some people might have ventricular assist device implanted. 